Thanks for joining everybody. Uh, if this is the first time you've been on the, one of our webinars, uh, welcome. Otherwise, you know, they're fairly casual. Uh, by all means, feel free to unmute your microphone and pop in. Otherwise, you can uh, type a question to me in the chat box and I'll bring it up with our speaker tonight, who is, this is Dr. George Behrens. He is a interventional radiologist working with Adventist uh, Health Partners in Illinois. He did his IR training at Rush University Medical Center. Um, so without further ado, uh, George, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dave, for the invitation. Again, it's for me, it's a pleasure to be with you guys. So basically, um, the reason that I put all this talk together is uh, I understand that you guys in different places that you, you guys are doing the fellowship or training, you know, you, you, you sort of like I see all this for sure, but it's really hard to put all this for sure together and see how you're going to manage the patient with a site or by of living or even as a follow-up. So most of the time, the patients are going to present with one of these three uh, chief complaints or reasons to consult you. And the whole point is to see when a patient comes with a status, what option do you have and where, which patient should go to which type of, or either procedure, each of these procedures. So again, you know, you have tapes, you have, uh, you know, BRTO, you have a embolization, then version, and, and forth. So, the whole point is, um, if you guys have any questions, you can interrupt at any time. So the whole point is sort of like I clarified all the ideas of different procedures that could be done in these patients. So it's it's um, um, this this port of hypertension and, and, and neat complication that it's again it's ascites and sclerosis and bleeding has been changed uh, in the last 20 years. Of course, new procedures are developing, and you know we add that to or are meant to treat this patient. So everything that I want to be talking about is going to be um, based on the Babeno classification. Basically, these are the group of people who sit down together and say uh, which procedure has like a basic, a, a, a medicine-based evidence, uh, say um, which one should be going through. So of course, the vast majority of procedures are not, um, don't have a good evidence-based medicine, but we're still going to talk about it. So what is really portal hypertension? Of course, it's a, uh, yeah, the increase in the portal pressure reflected by the gradient. Gradient more than five is portal hypertension. But is really significant having a gradient of five? Well, not really, because you we are worried about the gradient when the gradient is really about 10 to, to 12 millimeter, millimeter of mercury. So this gradient is, is the gold standard. But the Babeno classification is one, uh, one BA, and it's an indirect method of that measure the portal um, why is a gold, I mean, what is so utile to get this gradient is because really predict the prognosis and respond, uh, response for treatment. And again, you probably you guys know about it's calculated by the weight minus the three hepatic vein pressure. Uh, so this is a scheme of, you know, how we uh, measure the gradient. So we put a catheter balloon um, in the one of the hepatic veins, and we basically calculate the pressure with the balloon. When the balloon is inflated, we estimate the portal pressure itself. And then uh, when we subtract the, the pressures, I mean, the, the watch minus the, the prehepatic, what we really are measuring is the resistance of the liver for the pressure from the portal system into the hepatic gas. So why we also measure the gradient? Because we're trying to avoid the influence of the abdominal pressure. You know, patient who has a tense ascites is going to be uh, having a, a false elevation of the, of the polar pressure because, you know, the belly is, I mean, the, the belly is tense. And then also, if you put the, the, the uh, transducer higher or lower on the table, you know, they're going to be a difference in pressure. That's why we are trying to measure in gradient to have more uh, homogeneous samples. So this is an example of how we measure it. So you must use a balloon. I know some people use the catheter and watch it on the liver, but it's not the right technique. It's a paper that was recently published with Malox uh, in uh, the summer last year. So um, again, it's an important parameter because uh, uh, allow us to call, classify the portal hypertension if it's a decompensated or, or compensated portal hypertension. The prognosis, because you, we ask, uh, you know, surgery data show that, you know, patients with a, a decompensated portal hypertension, actually they do poor and they die really soon. And, uh, you know, the response for therapy in a non-selective beta blocker, actually there are papers making pressure and injecting uh, uh, intravenous uh, beta blockers, and then they can see if they, the patient's going to do well with uh, oral medications like uh, propanolol for 
um, the management of portal hypertension. Or preoperative evaluation, the patient could be for the surgery or not. So, of course, direct measurement of the portal pressure cannot be, I mean, it's, it's more invasive and they can, you know, bring complications such as hemorrhage, fistulas, or thrombosis. So, you have to always keep in mind that uh, the classification, the, you know, the medical classification of portal hypertension, the pre hepatic, hepatic, post hepatic. You have to remember that because a patient who has a, a thrombosis of the portal vein, they're going to have a false um, normalized uh, portal uh, gradient where it's not really that great and because the patient, I mean, the, the, you cannot measure the, the real pressure or, or the, the, the real gradient because the thrombosis doesn't allow it to transmit the pressure from the, from the portal system. So it, it's always keeping in mind that because it, you see it often. You, you see it more than you think you will see it. Uh, again, I mean, one, one key point in the, the whole presentation I want to emphasize is the degree of portal hypertension incompensated versus decompensated for hypertension. Because as I'm gonna show you later on, you know, there are different treatments for compensated portal hypertension patient with ascites or patient with decompensated portal hypertension who present with ascites. So which are the complications? What we're gonna see the patient from? It's gonna come through the door or whatever they're gonna refer to that. And it's gonna say, well, I have a patient, 65 year old male with a recurrent and refractory ascites. So, or the patient present with a varicella or encephalopathy. Anyway, so when um, when the patient present with a side, usually when a gradient is at least eight. So you know if the patient uh, came with uh, to you and say, well, I have this fluid build it up in my belly. So you know that the gradient is going to be at least eight. So it's going to be for hypertension for sure. So, but then you have to distinguish between uh, compensate or decompensate for hypertension. And then when you have a variceal bleeding of data from mold innumerable papers in IR literature actually uh, showing that the the virus of bleeding occur only when the patient had a, a decompensated portal hypertension, usually, of course, uh, with a gradient more than 12. Yeah, and cephalopathy really doesn't depend on the pressure, it just depends on the liver dysfunction. Of course, unless the patient had a, a portal segment shunt where, you know, the shunt is not, of course, it's, it's, it's you know, all the, the blood with the, this, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, protein natural fluid is going toward the shunt and then of course it's not filtered by the liver. So what about a patient with ascites? So uh, of course it's a, one of the most frequent complications of vascular process and it's really important because this patient can develop a patrimonial syndrome in a body And as, if you see, if you follow patients uh, over the time, you're going to see a, a bunch of people will have develop a, a, a patrimonial syndrome or even a, a, a body hydrothorax. Um, but um, and that, that is actually it's a really poor performance when they develop these kind of sim uh, syndromes. Um, large volume paracentesis is actually the way that this most of the patient has been treated. If you go to a small community hospital, you can see a bunch of people that have been treated with a large volume paracentesis. And um, the key point is that the refractory ascites do not respond to diuretic. That diuretic is a medical treatment for it. It's uh, you give a uh, uh, spironolactone and uh, and um, Lasix. And they, they don't respond to this. And the patient become oligoid. So every time that you tap a patient, you, you drain the, all the fluid, the patient become uh, oligoid right away. Uh, they, don't, they don't produce any urine. And they, you know, the urine is, uh, the excretion of sodium is start to going down. And that's when the bathorino start to become because you know, there is vasoconstriction, the uh, um, afferent loop of the, of the, of the uh, in the, in the kidney. And then, you know, you, you don't excrete the sodium, and the patient becomes more egoist, trying to retain the fluid, to try to build it up again in the abdominal cavity. So this is really important in this. So acidosis is equal to poor prognosis. If you see the data, 50% uh, of the patient will die in five years. If the patient has refractory acidosis, 50 of them is going to die in one year. So the, again, the hepatic renal syndrome is the most serious complication. Type 1 is a really progressive when the patient feels they start to go downhill. And the patients start with the creatinine start to uh, do, uh, multiply or duplicate in a, in a period of, of days, um, and it's really uh, a bad prognosis. And type two is uh, something that we see more often: it's a more constant renal dysfunction, and then when you start tapping, they start to get more uh, renal dysfunction. And uh, and hepatic hydrotorics usually occur in 10% of the patients, but you can actually see patients with uh, developing hepatic hydrotorics with minimal amount of ascites. So. So how you evaluate a patient? Of course, you know, physical 
and here's her physical exam. The labs, you want to make sure, you know, how's it, you know, um, albumin of the patient, the protein, the protein is all the, the and bilirubin, and bilirubin is probably one of the most important factor when you calculate the MEL score and other scores that have been developed. Um, you're gonna uh, calculate the chop view and the MEL score and melt sodium score. Maybe those melt sodium score is a uh, score that was developed trying to, uh, trying to put into consideration the sodium, the, ser the serum sodium uh, as a variant in the MEL score in patient with ascites. Of course, um, what I recommend or a lot of people recommend to use it. Uh, to do is a transcular liver biopsy in a way that you can uh, assess if the really the patient has a uh, stage four uh, virgin fibrosis or well known as a cirrhosis. And then, of course, hemodynamic evaluation because if the patient has uh, compensated poor hypertension and decompensated, it's going to change in the management of the patient when the patient becomes a uh, half a size. And then a triple phase of the liver uh, because if the patient had an HCC, of course, it's going to change the entire picture because now. It's, I know that you want to treat the site, but actually, if, the, if you discover the patient had an HEC, and maybe the patient can become a transplant candidate, and then you're not too worried about the site, it's because at the end, you treat the HEC with the transplant, and then the patient will get rid of the site. So that's why it's really important. You will see a, uh, innumerable patients that they have never had a uh, liver phase of the day, a triple phase of the MRI. So this is a really algorithm that I want to talk. Um, again, you know, it's based on a patient who uh, presents to you with ascites. So what you're going to do next is going to be a, a triple phase of the liver and a dual transcular liver biopsy with a hemodynamic evaluation. Transcular liver biopsy because then you confirm the diagnosis of cirrhosis. And then, there's, of course, the hemodynamic evaluation to see if it's compensated or compensated. Why? Because if you see here a patient with a compensated um, portal hypertension, you can do a Denver form. And a decompensated, you can do it. Why I don't put a patient with a compensated portal hypertension to a tip. Because if you do a tips in a patient with a compensated, uh, compensated uh, portal hypertension, you're gonna see this is a typical patient that comes with a just recent onset of ascites. He was cirrhotic for a few years, but now is the time that he's becoming uh, with a portal hypertension. So most of the clinicians say, well, I don't wanna be for rest, I don't wanna go tips. And then, you know, you don't wanna go too, too, in, too, too deep into it, but, um, because you can increase the morbid mortality in the patient with tips, uh, or uh, at the same time, you don't you you want to treat the ascites per se. You don't want to you know deal with other problems. And the, in the other hand, if you're trying to do uh, in this group of patients with a compensated uh, poor uh, the compensated poor hypertension, you put a Denver shunt. Then this patient, because it has a big gradient, they can bleed. And then if you see the literature from the 1980s. You know, the vast majority of the literature say, well, one of the problems with the Denversion is that most of the patients bleed after you do a Denversion, or they develop a later on a complication of bleeding. Why that happened? Because they were putting Denversion in patients with compensated for hypertension. Those patients should go to a TIPS rather than a, than a, than a Denversion. So again, you do the, the, the CT of MRI of the liver. If the patient had a HCC, then again, you, you move the patient towards a, a, your wall is trying to get rid of the HCC either you do a, a, a liver transplant if the patient is candidate for it, given the, uh, following the, the Milan uh, criteria, or uh, you can treat the, 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 uh, the HCC per se, either um, wine or okay, Kimball situation, whatever you want to do for, for, for the treatment of HCC. And then you can either put a Denbertron at the same time, or you can do other maneuvers for it. So, and a patient who are not uh, having an HCC, you're going to calculate the mouse score. If the patient had a high male score, you can send this patient for liver transplant. Why? Because um, the male score is, is what's going to determine who, what, which patient is going to get a liver transplant. So if the patient has a low male score, you know by a fact that the chance that this guy is going to get a liver is going to take a year. So then you're going to need to manage the patient, either medical management, given um, uh, uh, diuretics and propanolol, or uh, you're going to do some, some other maneuver. So if the patient failed to medical treatment, it's about 30 to 50% uh, of the patient, then you're going to consider either a Demerson or a TIPS, depending on the, of the, of the, of the situation again. Okay. So medical treatment. Again, medical treatment is spironolactone and plus uh, ACE uh, uh, diuretics and a large volume paracentesis. Large volume paracentesis, that 
it's not recommended. Why? Because, you know, when you do a large quality pressure test, what happens is you take all this fluid out, let's say you take about 10 liters out, and then the car, car the company increase. Why? Because it's trying to compensate. You have a splenic, a splenic uh, basal, uh, basal dilation and vasoconstriction on the kidneys. So and then the, the blood pressure decreases, the uh, circulation uh, uh, decreases also, and, uh, and then the patient starts to accumulate fluid. More that you tap the patient, more that they're going to develop uh, fluid. Of course, you, with this, uh, this mechanism is, is regulated by the renin, aldosterone, and the sympathetic uh, system. And the, you know, the, some of the literature say that the infusion of lumen the, can decrease the, the circulatory dysfunction about uh, 50 to 15 percent of the patient. That's why some of the people give uh, one gram of uh, Again, uh, this is just a medical manager. So I want to talk about a little bit of uh, temperature in the management of society with a patient with compensated oral hypertension. So what is that temperature? Temperature is basically um, a pre you can nowadays you can create a precursor. It's a, a, a shunt that you create in the cavity in the it's a shunt between the peritoneal cavity and the and the venous system. Basically, it's kind of the same thing that to place a permanent dialysis catheter. And um, and, uh, um, and a catheter in, in the abdomen with just both together. So basically, you create a, a little hole here. You put the the, the, um, the peritoneal part of, of the shunt, and then you create a supercutaneous channel all the way up. You access the the um, IJ, and you put your your catheter on. This is a picture of the catheter versa of the shunt. And what is the benefit on it? So when you uh, shunt or send all this fluid into the circulation, what you're going to do is increasing the effective uh, blood volume towards the kidney. So the renal blood flow increase and the diuresis increase. That's one of the things that are completely opposite of the large volume presentation where the renal blood flow de uh, decrease and the diuresis decrease. So and then, of course, all the protein acid fluid that is in the belly, in the abdomen, is going to go again to the circulation. So they say, or the literature say, every time they drain about 10 liters of fluid out of the abdomen, you are taking out of a patient about 200 grams of protein. Think about it. If you're taking about, if you're doing a paracentesis every, I don't know, every a week probably. So you are taking about four times a week, uh, four times a month. So it's 800 grams of protein every month. It's almost a kilogram or one kilogram a month of protein, only proteins. So it's like uh, the muscular mass diminishing in this patient. This patient become cachectic in a matter of years. In one year, the patient is lost his entire proteins. So, of course, if you send all this protein acid fluid to the uh, circulation, they retain all these nutrients. And then, of course, the patient become much better because they have energy. Um, so, which are the indications? So, of course, patients with recurrent and refractory attacks who, uh, and, uh, and also who has a compensated for hypertension, um, uh, which fail to medical treatment. Of course, patients with portal hypertension, patients that are waiting for liver transplant. Actually, you can put a, a shunt, that we have even placed shunt patients with, with, uh, which has severe ascites and had a HCC, and we're waiting for them to get transplant, and we put the, the shunt only just to manage the ascites. So a patient who had a malignant ascite, a patient with ovarian carcinoma, you can put a shunt of it. Of course, you know, the only, if you start to put all these patients together, you're gonna see a patient with malignant ascites, they have more shunt dysfunction than others. So of course, one indication is going to be infection. Of course, in bacteria, that's that's common. So here are pictures of uh, Demerchon that, that um, I place. Uh, again, you know, peritoneal access. You put your pillow with sheet. It's like a put in a blurt. You put your catheter in. You create a subcutaneous tunnel. So you put your bulb shunt, and then you get access into the IJ. You create, I create already the tunnel all the way up, and then put the shunt. It's really simple. It's not uh, difficult for us as interventional. So what about a patient with decompensated portal hypertension? So a patient, again, who which had a decompensated portal hypertension and their brain is more than 12, they fell to medical management. That is the first line of treatment. And then um, you uh, go to a TIPS. Um, of course, you guys know about the TIPS. It's an, um, a transvenous intraparty portal system shown, but it's a non-selective term between the portal vein, of course, and the, uh, the hepatic veins. So we just we just we still using the chop loop classification because that gives us a little prognosis on it. If a patient with a chop loop A is a good prognosis, B of course as we go on it's going to be more poor prognosis. And the MOL score, the MOL score it's actually 
And the number that you guys have to remember is 18. It's not that really cut off, but it's a good thing to remember. 18, because if you see all the scores and in tips, if you remember number 18, it's going to be really helpful for your practice. Because a patient with us who has a, a mouse score less than 18 is got a good prognosis. More than 18 is kind of in term, in the term, I mean, let's say medium to poor prognosis. A patient who has a, a mouse score more than 24 is contraindicated. If you do a tips in a patient who has a mouse score more than 24, yeah, the patient is going to die in less than 30 days. Um, what about uh, um, the melt sodium score again, in the management of alcohol? So, of course, uh, again, I, that's what I was telling you guys. Uh, it, um, you know, uh, they put the consideration the sodium because they say that the serum sodium, when it's dismissed, it's increased in mortality. So, basically, uh, 15 has been the cutoff for, for optimal uh, management of a patient with a site. Although, you know, uh, the new literature say that the melt score, sodium score, melt sodium score is not uh, a good prognosis or it's not a good uh, a score to, for the management of a site. So what's your, what, what are the results? So technical success is about 95 to 100 percent, and uh, much uh, the vast majority of the patients will have a resolution of the site. It's about 83 percent. So again, the procedure time is going to be the hand operator. It's going to be about two hours, and the mortality is really low. So here, this is what is important. So after you create a tip, uh, about a year out of the tip, the sodium excretion, I mean, excretion of sodium in the patient is going to increase making the uh, renal function better um, in approximately about half of the year the patient is going to have a significant improvement of the of the of the renal and function uh, the plasma renin and losterone system is going to uh, it's going to decrease so again this is going to go back to normal what the patient should have and then the cardiac at the beginning is to, uh, increase but then later on the the, the uh, of the a year out then the, the cardiac output is going to be about the same of it was before. Uh, so all the patients who had a TIPS, then you start to have more muscle mass, the, the body cell mass increase, and the fat mass decrease, and the, the energy and intake of the patient, of the energy of the patient increase significantly after the procedure. So that's why it's, it's important. So uh, what happened when you do a TIPS um, in, a, in, in the older type of complication of auto hypertension? So of course, if you, if you do a TIPS, you are treating the patient for the ascites. That was the main symptom why you did the, the procedure itself. But then also you are treating for the partial bleeding. Again, I, we're talking about a patient who had a decompensated for hypertension who has a gradient of more than 12. So this patient has the tendency to develop partial bleeding. So of course, if you do a TIPS, you are treating both. So the, of course, the data have been shown that the TIPS is much better in the paternal partial bleeding than the large volume percentage. Of course, their tips, as I mentioned before, has a, a good effect in quality of life because of the most of the matter energy, but um, they do not increase the, the survival, increase the survival. So the present this is what I was saying, you know, 200 grams of protein every 10 liters. And of course, the downside of it is uh, encephalopathy. So if the patient had an encephalopathy from the get-go, so you create a tip, they're going to have 30, 40% chances to develop more encephalopathy afterwards. And it's a normal patient. So a patient who already has encephalopathy is going to be even worse. Uh, the, one of the problems with the disease is decreases you know, the liver function. So multiple studies again showed significant improvement in the or response of the in the management of ascites, but the survival is not significant. There's no a study shown uh, right now so far that showed significant improvement uh, of uh, survival in a patient with uh, dips for in survival. Uh, I mean survival in a patient with dips. Um, so actually, in the, in the new literature and in, in the new in the register in Germany, 68% uh, uh, of the patient actually the main indication is ascites. Actually, ascites nowadays tends to be the, the main indication for them for tips for sure, rather than bleeding that was just to be in the past. So this is just a picture of the of the tips. Uh, what about um, now? We're going to change another talk. So what about partial bleeding? A patient come or a patient come to the hospital with partial bleeding. They call you and say, hey. I have a patient that has a varicell bleed. I think the patient is cirrhotic, or a patient has cirrhosis based on the imaging. Um, but again, you know, you are not entirely sure. So, what about Babeno classification? Babeno classification uh, classifies the patient in four different. Ways. So this patient can present either a patient who is bleeding but do not have a. a uh, I'm sorry, a portal hypertension. So the patient uh, had a portal hypertension but do not have a portal uh, esophageal virus. Well, those patients. 
uh, can have uh, just a side disorder. For patients who have esophageal viruses, will never bleed. Patient who has a varicell hemorrhage, acute varicell hemorrhage, or patient who bled one time, and you are trying to um, treat the patient to prevent any recurrence. So the recurrence rate is about 50 to 60 percent. So, or treatment, or, or uh, I mean, we as an interventional radiologist, we're going to be uh, treating this kind of patient. Patient with acute varicell bleeding, or patient who bled and required treatment to prevent uh, recurrence of the bleeding. So, uh, which patient are going to bleed? So if you see a patient who had a decompensate for a heart attack, which, I mean, are they going to bleed? Yes or no? That's a, a, a question because that's why we were talking about a compensator versus decompensated for a heart attack. So a patient who had a compensated for a heart attack, they have 30% chances that they're going to bleed. If they have decompensated for a heart attack, it's double. It's 60%. And the vast majority of them, again, is going to be a gastroesophageal virus. Only 20% of them are going to see isolated gastroviruses or they're going to have a mix of both. So in acute variceal hemorrhage, or a patient who came and said, well, he has an acute variceal hemorrhage, um, what are you going to do? Of course, you know, medical treatment first, to stabilize the patient with, uh, uh, you know, transfusion, and uh, antibiotics, pressure, all that stuff. So uh, most of these patients go to EGD. That's the that's way that they know that it's bleeding from the variceal hemorrhage. And the, the, the studies have shown that a patient who had um, endoscopy within um, 12 hours of admission they can have a good result with a, a variceal ligation. And a patient who fails to variceal uh, ligation, they, they call you, usually they call you and say, hey, you know, I have a patient who I, I attempt to do a variceal uh, ligation, but you know what? The patient is still bleeding. So actually, that's one of the few indications that is completely approved and say that medicine based, evidence based medicine shows that it's 1AA, showing that it's actually the right thing to do. So, of course, patients with child to score C or green that are really high grain, they are considered as a, as a, as a high risk patient. So, uh, randomized trials have been shown that, of course, increases survival in patients who do that really early after they start to bleed, and uh, they have a uh, significant decrease in the bleeding recurrency. So, now what about a patient? They say, well, I have a patient who bled last night, and we controlled the bleeding with. Uh, with a partial with a band, and uh, you know, I want you to see what else you could do for for this patient because you know the patient had a decompensate for it. So you know that this patient is going to be in about fifty percent. So well, if you did a tips and those patients from the beginning, let's say, well, again, you know, they consult and say, well, they, I control the bleeding, but I this patient is going to bleed. You ended up in doing a tip. So you did a procedure. What are you going to do? Just follow the patient. Make sure you know that they pay the. Uh, the tip is patent and all the stuff, but the patient doesn't develop any kind of other complication. So a patient who responds to medical treatment, you're going to continue with the prophylactic medication. But then you are going to consider a tip. If the patient had any stigmata that is going to bleed again, or a patient that, you know, is a high risk for bleeding, if the patient bleeds, it's going to die, or something like that, then you're going to consider a tip for this kind of patient. So how do you evaluate the patient? A physical history, labs. EGD, of course, and showing that you know the part, the degree of viruses. Um, again, I recommend you to get a transdural liver biopsy with hemodynamic evaluation because then you're going to start to find the patient to compensate it or compensate it. It's the same, pretty, pretty much the same principle: triple head of the liver and transdural liver biopsy. So here you have a patient who has a severe acute bleeding, or you are treating for rebleeding prophylaxis. So you do um, your uh, transgular biopsy and the image. So you get a CT and MRI or MRI, whatever, whatever you want to do, you know, depending on the patient. And if the patient had um, only gastroesophageal viruses or gas, mainly gastroesophageal viruses, you're going to calculate the mouse score. If the mouse score is more than 18, it's a contraindication for a tip. It's not a really contraindication per se, like 100%. But you know that more than 18, it's not going to do well, or more than 24 for sure, it's a contraindication. For more than 18, it's not going to do too well. So you want to try to avoid a, uh, a tips as you can. So, but if the patient had a less than 18, there's no question. You're going to go straight to a tips. So that's what is here. So if the patient had a, a contraindication of tips or has a, a is isolated gastric virus, you're going to go and um, you're going to see the CT. If the patient had a gastroesophageal shunt, you're going to go for a BRTO. If the patient do not have a uh, BRTO and has a B, uh, elevated uh, MEL score, 
So you know that if you do a tip, the patient may die. So you're going to consider other techniques. So let's say the patient um, uh, is bleeding profusely. I mean, the patient is dying, basically is dying. So you can do percutaneous variceal embolization. Either percutaneous, you stick the liver directly into the portal vein, you go to the virus itself, you put some coils, you can even put a gel phone with a sotradecular and, and any kind of agent that to test grow the viruses, and you can just control that. I mean, actually, that was the original technique described by Rush. I mean, I don't know, many, 40 years, 30, 30 years ago, that was the, the way that they embolized the virus. Or you can uh, go to a splitting artery embolization. I don't know how many of you guys know about a splitting artery embolization in the management of portal hypertension, but um, the data has been shown that it's a really good technique, and you should think about it. So I'm going to show you some of the data later on. So what about, OK, let's go here. So a patient who had a MELS score less than 18, you're going to do a tips. There's no question about it. That's all the data you guys know. You probably have been here this before. So what is the goal of the tips? So the goal of the tips is to create the gradient in less than 12, because you're going to, be, you're going to uh, convert a patient from a decompensated for hypertension to a compensated for hypertension. Or at least, let's say, well, of course, you, sometimes you can uh, reach this goal. So if you decrease the, the pressure in about 30, 20 to 30 percent, the patient is not going to bleed. Most likely, of course, it's not 100 percent. Medicine error is 1 percent. You don't want to decrease the gradient less than 5. Because if you decrease the gradient less than 5, or you don't want to have a, then you don't have flow into the shunt. So the shunt is going to go through by its own. It's going to have thrombosis of, of the tip. So you don't want to be too crazy about it then, over the lid, or put a big shunt on it, thinking that you, you're going to put it less than 12. So where are the real contraindications? You guys have seen uh, uh, tips lectures before, so the right heart failure, severe pulling hypertension, or severe hepatic failure, which is, of course, they're going to do poor high MELS score. Relative uh, contraindication, the infection, encephalopathy, and uh, poor vein thrombosis. Hepatic tumors is uh, it's a relative contraindication, and some people don't believe in that. Uh, some people do. So um, again, mortality score, that's bigger the child, I mean, uh, seeing child plus, of course, poor prognosis, and MELS score, of course, um, and that's the main uh, score that we use. So again, 18 is the number to remember. Um, more than 18, you kind of have to think about it. Less than 18, go ahead and do it. So that's here, this is a mortality rate. So 70% of 30 years. more than uh, 24, so you're not going to do it. Um, so this is uh, a um, really well-known paper from Dr. Farrell. Where he's showing that you know the most score is higher than it goes, of course the mortality is higher. So what about the Apache two score? It's another score. Some people use, some people don't. Where they say that a uh, Apache score is for a patient who has to to go to emergency tip, a patient with acute very self bleeding, um, massive bleeding, whatever. And you know again, 18 is kind of the number. Um, a patient with an 18 uh, Apache score more than 18 Apache score with a child to see, the mortality is 110 and 30 days. So actually, the most common cause of this is organ failure. So this is a picture of the tips. Um, what about if you compare tips versus sclerotherapy? I mean, um, endovas uh, endoscopic management versus uh, tips. Of course, the tips is going to decrease, significantly decrease in the bleed rate when you compare it to sclerotherapy, um, but the mortality rate is being the same. So there is, again, the tips do not increase the more, do not uh, increase the survival but significantly decrease the chance of bleeding. So what are the conclusions of um, what, what do you expect of your tips? Um, the tip is really effective in the management of uh, uh, baricell bleeding. Uh, of course, uh, prevent the recurrency, recurrent bleed, but do not improve the survival. And of course, the scores are really extremely useful in um, the evolution of the patient. And please remember that now score more than 24, don't do it because the patient is going to die. For more than 18, just be careful because those patients are not, are not going to do well. So what about BRTO? Again, BRTO, we're talking a patient who has either isolated gastric viruses or patient who has isogastric esophageal viruses with a MELS score elevated. So you think about when through BRTO, they have a scastic uh, spinorenal shunt. So um, I think you guys recently have a one uh, webinar about this. So it's the second more cause of the upper GI bleeding and the portal hypertension. And it's, of course, require more transfusion, high mortality, high mor morbidity than uh, gastroesophageal virus. So if you think, if you see these numbers here, so 44% of the patients will bleed at five years. 
So, the, of course, endoscopical management, you know, it's kind of the first line of treatment, although no many people do endoscopical management because it's not easy to perform and the data doesn't show too much of, uh, benefit from it um, because they don't, they, they fail often. And uh, multiple studies have shown that the, the rebleeding rates are quite high, uh, similar in the sclerotherapy versus banding and sclerotherapy. And when they use glue, they tend to be a little bit better. But when you compare with the with the endovascular management or BRDOs, of course, it's not comparable. So it's much better the BRDO than the endoscopic management. So here is kind of scheme of you know why it be of, of the viruses per se draining into the to the left renal vein. Um, so um, the gastric viruses uh, actually this is a Japanese technique where they used to use it. They don't do this. They actually do more BRDO than a deep procedure in Japan. Um, so actually, the BRDO. One thing that you have to remember: the BRDO is the only procedure in oral hypertension who actually increase the function of the liver, make the liver work better. Because what you do is uh, it's blocking the shunt, the, the spontaneous shunt that you have between the portal system and systemic circulation. Would you block it? So now you're pushing the blood. Or force the flow go towards the liver, so you make the liver work harder. You push them to to work harder, and it's the only also procedure in portal hypertension who actually is going to decrease encephalopathy again because it's the same principle. It's going to increase the liver function. So in uh, actually the United States right now, um, it's becoming more the the BR2 is becoming popular, and I the bunch of people are nowadays is doing a BR2 for management of patients with a gastric of uh, Gastric viruses, isolated gastric virus. It's an example of a patient with a large gastric virus in the front the stomach, a draining and spontaneous renal spawn here. So this is a procedure uh, per se, uh, catheterizing with a stimulus to gather into the into the, the shunt. Uh, I personally I embolize the the the, the uh, adrenal vein. Um, also, there are coils in the in the splenic artery uh, as part of the procedure. So here are the pictures of the injecting the, the sotra decol with a uh, gel form and lipado, and then how the uh, escrosy engine stay there. And so this is a follow up after six years. You can see all the viruses here in the front of the stomach with the impact of the spleen because I tend to use both techniques, spleen artery embolization plus BRDO for the management of this patient. And then six years later, that the viruses are completely gone. This patient is still alive. Um, what are the indications of this BRTO is for isolated gastric viruses or patient with a refractory encephalopathy who has a gastrorenal shunt. If they don't have a gastrorenal shunt, of course, you know. Um, or patient who had a um, gastroesophageal virus with a relative contraindication property. Again, we're talking a patient who had a mouse score more than 18 or uh, more than 24 for sure, more than 18 relatively, or a sharp to score C. Contraindication, of course, is you cannot occlude the shunt or patient who had a quarter of occlusion. Or of course, you're not going to do it because if you do it, the patient is going to screw. So the results, the technical success is is, is high. It's almost, I will say, like 90 percent, 95 percent. That um, the technical success is about 91, almost 95 percent. The complications are minimal. And actually, one thing that you have to keep in mind that the patient who had, I mean, the all the studies have been uh, five studies shown that. 100% of the patient has significant improvement of encephalopathy. So, but I'm, why I'm emphasizing this because actually this is a dream for encephalopathy in a patient with a gastroesophageal shunt. So, what about a splenic artery embolization? Again, I'm going to go to the to the diagram. A patient who had a either do not have a gastrorenal shunt and or a patient who had a um, a really high MELS score prohibited to uh, develop. But to do performative, so you can think about a spring artery embolization. Why? What is the theory behind it? If you reduce the splenic blood flow, you're going to decrease the splenic uh, venous drainage. So then you're going to decrease the pressure. So the the spleen itself it uh, contributed about a 30 40 percent of the flow of the splenic of the of the portal flow. So if you decrease the um, the spleen volume in about 50 to 60 percent. You are decreasing the portal pressure in about 30 percent. So let's say that a patient had a 18 of, of uh, 80 millimeter mercury as a gradient. 
So if you embolize the 50% of the 60% of the of the of the spleen, you're going to decrease in 30%. So it's about uh, probably it's, uh, three fourths, uh, two fourths, about five six millimeter of mercury. So you're going to convert a patient with the compensator for the to a compensator for the If you convert that patient and has a grade in less than 12, then the patient is not going to bleed because the data shows that a patient with a less than 12 there is a low chance of bleeding. So uh, there are multiple papers about this topic showing that endoscopic um, band ligation plus partial splenectomy, the, the patients do not bleed. And there were significant, um, uh, it's a statistically significant, patients do not, they, they don't bleed when they, they did this uh, procedure. Um, of course, the patient, you are treating both things. So improve the hyperesthesia, so the patient, the platelets go up. And, um, the, the flow of the protein, of course, is gonna is gonna decrease. And of course, the people is out, it's afraid of a splenic abscess. But the technique for the for this for the, uh, splenic artery embolization is put cause in the mid um, a splenic artery. So you don't want to go so distal, where you're gonna have um, the small circulation get occluded because those are the patients that are gonna develop abscesses. So if you occlude more central, more toward the hilum of the spleen, or more uh, uh, the one in the in the mid third of the spleen artery, so those patients are not going to develop a spleen abscess. So that's what the people is afraid of. So a paper uh, published in 2007, where they review all the literature on the spleen artery embolization. So they what they found is that there is a significant decrease in the bleeding episode from 2.4 episodes per year to 0 0.48. It's just only with the spleen artery embolization. So 80% of the patient will uh, decrease in the in the uh, bleeding of gastric per year. Viruses, so it, it does. It works. Actually, it works. And uh, of course, you know, if you, it's not only the bleeding episode. You actually uh, decrease the hyperestrogen, so the blood are going to go up. The white counts going to go up. The hemoglobin is going to go up because you know you the spin is out. Um, it's out. No, it's just it's, it's basically that. Um, so this is an, a case of a spring artery embolization where I put some calls. As again, you can see here. That I put calls here, so you are not afraid that the patient is going to develop abscess because the short gastrics so coming from the stomach are going to supply and uh, reperfuse the spleen, but it's not going to be in the same degree that it was before. So that's why that the splenic artery embolization works. What about a transjugular or percutaneous embolization of gastric so your bikes? What I mean with that is that you go percutaneous, you act to the portal vein, or you go transjugular, like you're going to do a tips to get the catheter in the portal system. You, you catheterize the virus per se, and then you put coils, either coils or you coil and inject some um, um, escrocin agent. So that was the original technique described by Rock many, many years ago. So the problem with that technique is that fail. So the re-bleeding rates are really high. It's between 33 and 45%. Uh, but if you look at literature, those literature that is showing those, uh, that technique, it was in the old, old literature where they were only using coil. So now that we have a corrosion agent such as sotradecol that you can mix it with a gel phone, probably the re-bleeding there is going to be lower. Uh, there is no study showing how low it is, but but probably it's going to be lower. So actually, you reserve this technique when the patient is it's an emergency situation. The patient is sanguinated, is bleeding profusely, the floor is full of blood, everything is full of blood. So you want to control the bleeding in a way that you can transfer the patient or you can do something to have the patient to get the drops on, the liver drops on, because those patients deteriorate quite fast. So of course, you're gonna have to reserve only with a patient with a really high NOS score um, that is gonna, gonna be candidate for a liver drops on. So this is a case of that. This patient was pretty much dead on my table, and what I did was put a bunch of coils and embolize it with uh, some um, agent here uh, trying to uh, preserve the flow. So you can see at the end of the procedure, I uh, put innumerable cords there and there's no flow into the viruses. So what about it? Um, oops. Well, I'm sorry. It's missing here, but uh, the encephalopathy. The encephalopathy, the only man, uh, treatment that we have for the management of encephalopathy is that very complication for hypertension is BRTO. BRTO, because again, you are obliterating the, the portal systemic uh, shunt. Uh, you push the flow towards the liver, and you have at least 100% of the patient. I mean, 100% of the patient are going to have significant improvement 
of the encephalopathy symptom. In about 70%, 60 to 70% of the patients there that they uh, were consulted for minimal sign of encephalopathy, they're going to have complete, almost complete resolution of encephalopathy. So, um, again, this is a just a resume or a summary of the, like I put all the different treatment options that we have on interventional radiologists to treat all the patients with, or all the patients who present with complications of photohypertension. Do you have any question? Thank you very much. No, thank you, George. That was a very thorough talk, and you got you got through a lot of information in a short amount of time. And uh, those algorithms. I mean, I know you've done a very thorough. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll open it up for uh, I'll open it up for questions. I do have one. Does anybody else have one? Or you can again, you can either unmute your microphone and speak, or you can. Uh, Type them to me if you're not comfortable, and I'll, I'll gladly ask George. Uh, well, question about the Denver shunt. Uh, do you, how often um, have you seen like people that get infections, or are they commonly get infected, or do they have to be on prophylactic antibiotic? Or well, I, I, my my experience with the Denver shunt when they they become infected is the patient had a either let's say the patient before we put a, a shunt a Denver shunt, you know the patient is. Like I had a um, you know endoscopic procedure ERCP where they put a stand or something like that that they have open and they have a bacterium and they shouldn't get infected. Usually, what I've seen is that you know you you have a patient with what I it's presumable of course yeah, a patient was bacteriumic the time that we put the shunt because a, a long term when I when you put the shunt I have no I I've seen it a couple times only two or three times where you put the shunt and then the patient become infected later on, let's say a year after you put a Denver shunt. It's, that's the tendency right now. I don't know, before they say that they, you know, the people uh, get infections all the time, because of, you know, bacterial peritonitis. I don't see that often. I, what I see is patient, you know, I put the shunt and two, two weeks later, the, the side of its redness, and you know, it's like a, when you put a port and they, they get infection of the port. So I don't know that there was a technical issue where, you know, you opened your incision, you didn't quite uh, clean the patient well, or, or the patient was bacteriemic. But I have a, one patient where uh, he came and we did an ambition and the patient developed an infection like a two or three months after. And find, uh, what we found is the patient had a liver acid, a huge liver acid, and I don't know, was infected. What, what do you want me to say? So, but other than that, not really. It's not. It's not common the infection for a while. Not. Not so that it used to be. The bad. Or at least what the literature say was the bad. Anybody else have any questions for Dr. Barron while we have? I'm getting a lot of thank yous, George, from people. They're sending it to uh, me a lot of thank yous for taking your time and doing this. Last call. Anybody with questions for Dr. Barron? I'm going to put my email here. So they have my email address here. So in case sure. they want to email me, feel free. They can feel, I mean, feel free to email me anytime. Um, no problem. I know that uh, it's a lot of information. It's really hard to follow through if you are not 100% paying attention. I don't expect that people are going to be paying attention. I don't know after a day of work. So, but I'm more than happy to share with you guys this lecture. Uh, sure, sure. You know, you guys can have it. You can ask for David to give it to you. George, yeah, so, he offered to send me the slides actually, and he he's okay with us. We're gonna put this on our YouTube channel for so for everybody who's still around. Um, if you're not signed up for our webinars, or if you want the link to our YouTube channel, um, just get in touch with us. I'll send an email right now, and uh, we'll go from there. So uh, thanks again, George, uh, buddy. Really appreciate you taking the time for doing this, and uh, we'll probably we'll probably have you come by and do another one in the future. No problem, my friend. Anytime, anytime that you get one, just feel free to you know contact me, and more than happy to help you guys. Yeah. All right, all right, everybody. Uh, have a good night. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm.